Welcome. On behalf of the Department of Linguistics, I'm Steve Anderson, the Chair of Linguistics here at Yale. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the assistance of the Camp Fund and of Calhoun College in making Noam Chomsky's visit to Yale possible, and also of the Yale Law School for making this facility available to us. There's a problem with speakers who need no introduction. It really won't do to let them go without one, but the introducer seldom has anything to say that warrants the time taken from the main event. So I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, I went to MIT to study linguistics in the mid-1960s, which was a time when Professor Chomsky's energy and attention was increasingly occupied with the resistance to the Vietnam War. I have to admit that a fair number of us graduate students were rather selfishly concerned that this effort would result in a decrease in the level of excitement of doing linguistics in his department. Well, we certainly didn't need to worry. Then, as now, he somehow managed to provide us with a constant series of new challenges in our field, while simultaneously challenging the conscience and sense of complacency of the society and the broader world with a series of incredibly detailed, incisive analyses of the events of our times. Actually, I'm not sure linguistics could have stood the strain of constant innovation that would have resulted if he'd had all his time free for science. <laughs> His ability to balance scientific activity with his life as a public figure surely has few, if any, parallels in our time. Indeed, when I heard the other day about the success of some Scots geneticists in achieving the cloning of a large mammal, I wondered a bit whether their results might not have been anticipated years ago at MIT in secret. I can't imagine how just one Noam Chomsky can possibly keep up with his reading, let alone produce the quantity and quality of written work that he has on linguistic, political, and economic issues ranging from Timor to the Middle East to Central America and South America and to our own society in this country that has come from him in the past 30 odd years. For those of us who know Noam Chomsky as the scholar who has essentially defined the terms of inquiry in modern linguistics, as well as much adjacent territory in psychology and philosophy, it always comes as a shock to see how differently the rest of the world sees him. I first became aware of this when I realized that the MIT branch of the Harvard Coop stocked copies of his book, Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, in the politics and current affairs section of the store. <laughs> I hate to think how many more stores did the same with lectures on government and binding. In responding to his work on political, economic, and social issues, as with his work in linguistics, one can sometimes disagree with the specifics of his analyses and conclusions, but their cogency and coherence are never in doubt. And it's virtually never possible to cite relevant factual or background material that he hasn't read and taken into account. Yesterday afternoon, in a lecture commemorating one of the major figures in linguistics in the history of the, our department here at Yale, Bernard Bloch, Professor Chomsky gave us a picture of the scope of his ideas in the science of language. Today, we're pleased and privileged to hear some of another side of his thought. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Noam Chomsky, who will speak to us today on neoliberalism and global order. Somebody uh, passed me a note yesterday in one of the many transitions up and back between meetings asking me to announce something, uh, an upcoming event, which I'm personally much interested in, but unfortunately I lost the note, so I'm not sure what the date was. Uh, it's uh, Constancio Pinto, who's uh, fled from East Timor, uh, who will be here, I think, March 6th. Anybody, is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so there'll be a meeting on that, which will be well worth going to, I'm sure, no, Constancio. Uh, okay, getting to this topic. Uh, there are two, uh, uh, two phrases in the title, uh, neoliberalism and global order. I'd like to say a bit about each of them. Uh, these are topics of enormous human significance. Uh, they're not very well understood, I think. Uh, the term neoliberalism, uh, suggests 
uh, a system of principles that is in the first place new uh, and in the second place based on classical liberal ideas. Uh, Adam Smith is typically revered as the patron saint. Uh, the same set of doctrines is also called the Washington Consensus, which may suggest something about global order. Uh, if we take a closer look, I think we find that the suggestion about global order is fairly accurate, but not the rest. Uh, the operative doc doctrines are not at all new, and they are very remote, in my opinion, from the leading ideas that animated the classical liberal tradition uh, since the Enlightenment. Well, before proceeding, a side comment on terminology. Uh, the terminology of social and political discourse is not a model of uh, crystal clarity. Uh, in this area, it is hopeless. Uh, so hopeless that communication is almost impossible. Uh, the standard usage here today is almost the reverse of traditional usage, uh, which is also common elsewhere in the world. Uh, so what we call here liberal um, in most places is called something like social democratic, uh, and what is called liberal in the tradition and virtually everywhere else, we don't really have any name for. Uh, sometimes it's called conservative, sometimes it's called libertarian, which just introduces even more confusion because the term libertarian is used here as virtually the antithesis of the traditional usage and the usage in most other places. Uh, else, here, libertarian means extreme uh, capitalist, which does indeed draw on a strand of classical liberalism, although not Adam Smith, I don't think. At least not the way I read him. Uh, but the traditional usage, and in fact the common usage elsewhere, uh, libertarian is used for anti-authoritarian, uh, which means anti-capitalist and anti-state. In fact, it's the traditional anti-state wing of the socialist movement, uh, which also claims roots in classical liberalism, not without reason, I think. Anyhow, these varying usages make uh, communication very difficult uh, and introduce endless confusions. Uh, although one could argue that it doesn't really matter very much, uh, the reason is that the actual practice uh, deviates so far from the professed doctrines that even if they were clearly expressed, uh, it would be a sort of matter of secondary importance, at least for understanding policies and practice. It's very important for understanding the doctrinal framework, or what in more honest days used to be called propaganda, and consider it a very good thing. Uh, in fact, even the essence of democracy in pretty much across the spectrum of modern political thought, including progressive tendencies, that's an important topic in itself, but one that I won't go into here. Well, anyway, that's a problem of communication. I hope it won't be too confusing. Uh, the uh, main theme in contemporary discourse is uh, the triumph of market democracy. And that is supposed to be the result of America's victory in the Cold War, which doesn't, wasn't just a victory, but a victory for principles, principles of democracy and the free market. And there's endless proclamations about that. It's even the, called the Clinton Doctrine, and uh, a lot of ringing rhetoric, which I don't have to bother quoting. The neoliberal Washington consensus uh, is supposed to be the expression of the triumph of these principles. Uh, it calls for, uh, one of the th major things it calls for is what's called minimizing the state. Uh, that, uh, now, if you minimize the state, you're maximizing something else. You're removing the state from some area of decision making, something else is moving in. So you minimize the state, something else is being maximized, uh, well, what is it that's being maximized? Where is decision-making power shifting? There's a standard theory about that, too, uh, into the hands of the people who are now liberated from the talons of the democratic state. So they're now free. The democratic state is out of their hair. Uh, reality, I think, is a little different. I'll return to that. Uh, just noting that from the very beginning, 
there's a certain tension that arises uh, between the two principles that are supposed to have uh, triumphed according to standard doctrine. I'll explore that a little bit as we go on. Well, let's turn to some concrete illustrations to see what's at stake. So take, for example, a lead, head, lead story in the New York Times about a week ago, front page story, uh, with a headline that reads, uh, U.S. is exporting its free market values. Okay, part of the general triumph. Uh, the story is about the World Trade Organization Agreement, uh, which uh, the signatories, meaning most of the world, uh, agree to open up their telecommunications uh, market to foreign enterprises with U.S. Uh, uh, corporations uh, very well positioned uh, to take a very good share, in fact, the overwhelming share of uh, the international communication system. Uh, the story goes on to explain, I'm quoting, that the agreement brings American-style competition to other countries, uh, which must now adopt American values, in particular our passion for free markets without state intervention, uh, which is illustrated most dramatically by telecommunications, the internet, and information technology, which is the wave of the future, thanks to traditional American values and their triumph, uh, in particular our passion for free markets with no government intervention. Uh, there's a side comment which points out that this opens the way to new forms of intervention uh, beyond anything that existed before into the internal affairs of other countries because they're now going to have to modify their internal structures and their legal system and so on to accommodate this American passion. Uh, and uh, it, it'll happen now in communications. Uh, notice that this is almost too obvious to discuss. Communications are a little bit different from automobiles. I mean, if you sell out your automobile system to foreign competitors, maybe good or bad, if communications are in the hands of somebody else, it's a little different. Communications are not automobiles. Uh, where there's even any pretense of democracy, uh, communications are at its heart. Automobiles are not at its heart. Uh, not a new thought. Uh, James Madison once said that a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a, force, uh, to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both is obvious enough, and of course it follows that concentration of control over communications in any hands, domestic or other, and certainly in foreign hands, uh, raises some rather serious questions about meaningful democracy. Uh, similarly, concentration of control over finance in any hands, particularly foreign hands, uh, raises questions about any hope of popular involvement in forming social and economic policy, which is another significant element of democracy, and similarly control over, say, food in any hands, particularly foreign hands, uh, raises some serious questions about survival. Uh, the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, about a year ago issued a strong warning to third world countries not to permit themselves to uh, allow food resources to be controlled elsewhere. I don't think it was even reported in the United States, but it's not a trivial issue. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, uh, the, I should just to add some comments. Control over food in foreign hands is very much underway. Uh, the next major target is liberal, what they call liberalization of financial markets, meaning the takeover of the global financial system by huge uh, financial giants, investment firms, overwhelmingly from the United States. Uh, again, some tensions arise about, among the various principles that are supposedly, supposedly have emerged victorious. Sort of keep them in the back of your mind. Uh, some further tensions arise of a much narrower kind. In fact, the very same day that the New York Times had this story hailing the triumph of the American passion for free markets, uh, as illustrated by U.S. takeover of communications in other countries, uh, the same day they also had an editorial. Uh, it warned the Europeans uh, not to uh, bring to the World Trade Organization uh, 
the, their complaint against the United States for violating free trade uh, in the case of the Helms-Burton uh, law, which uh, penalizes foreign investors in Cuba, effectively barring the U.S. market from them, which is a kiss of death of the way the international economy works. Uh, the editors accepted, without quest argument, the general assumption that if the World Trade Organization does rule on this, it'll rule U.S. actions to be in violation of the free trade agreement. And therefore, the Times naturally concludes that the World Trade Organization should not be allowed to rule. Uh, the United States has since refused participation, so the issue is moot. Uh, that, incidentally, is quite standard. Uh, so, for example, when the World Court was called upon to rule on U.S. terrorism against Nicaragua, as it did, uh, condemning the United States for the unlawful use of force and ordering it to uh, desist forthwith and pay enormous reparations, uh, the U.S. simply withdrew. Uh, since it was going to come out the wrong way, uh, the U.S. withdrew from jurisdiction on quite interesting grounds. Uh, it's interesting to look at the State Department submissions on this. Uh, the argument was pretty explicit. They said in the early days you know, of the United Nations, uh, the U.S. had the support of most countries of the world, among other reasons, because if they didn't support us, they would starve to death. Uh, but uh, they were sort of on our side, and we could count on most countries to do what we wanted. But now, with decolonization and all sorts of other things like that, you can no longer count on international institutions to do what the United States and demands that they do, uh, as a result, we're just going to pull out. Uh, because uh, democracy means we win. Uh, and if something else is going to happen, it's not democracy, so we're out. And in fact, that killed the world court decision. Very interesting to look at the US reaction to that, but I won't go into it. Uh, the phrases I just quoted, incidentally, I don't think ever were reported in the United States, uh, along with others. Anyhow, this is another case of exactly the same kind. The international institutions are going to rule the wrong way, so therefore you cancel their existence. Uh, that's the same time we're talking about the passion for free trade, in fact, the same day. Uh, well. Uh, there's other aspects of this. No, notice what it means is that intervention in the internal affairs of other countries on sort of trivial matters, like say food supply or communications or finance, that's okay as long as uh, US companies are gonna take over, but it's unacceptable uh, when the United States doesn't like the outcome in a crucial matter like strangulation of Cuba. Uh, in fact, the United States, in this case, is claiming a national security exemption. The World Trade Organization does permit exceptions for dire cases of national security, not things like food or communications and so on. But in this case, our existence is at stake uh, unless we succeed in strangling the Cuban economy, so it's a national security uh, exemption. And it's, that's, those are the words, you know. Uh, and uh, polite people are not supposed to laugh at this, they're also not supposed to remember the response of the uh, Mexican ambassador uh, when John F. Kennedy uh, asked Mexico to join in to an early stage of the aggression against Cuba, which was, remember, massive terrorism, economic strangulation, and so on. Uh, Mex he responded that uh, Mexico wouldn't be able to agree because if uh, Mexico were to announce that Cuba was a threat to its national security, 40 million Mexicans would die laughing. Uh, well, uh, here, uh, here well-educated people are much more sober, fortunately. Uh, and uh, those who are the beneficiaries of a good education might even be able to read the New York Times report, the official report of the official Clinton administration statement, uh, without laughing, the statement uh, ask, uh, which essentially kicked the World Trade Organization into the wastebasket on this issue. The official reason was that, I'm quoting it, Europe is challenging three decades of Cuban policy going back to the Kennedy administration aimed at forcing a change of the government in Havana. And obviously, that's our right. 
I mean, how could anyone question that we have a right to change another government, especially since we've been doing it for three decades? Uh, Stuart, <laughs> Stuart Eisenstadt, who made the statement, didn't look up the history. The official decision to overthrow the government of Cuba, uh, which is now declassified, was taken in March 1960 by the Eisenhower administration. It was just that the Kennedy administ administration stepped it up. Uh, increasing terror and economic strangulation, in fact, coming pretty close to a world war at one point. But since we've been at it for 30 years, uh, well, and our goal is to overthrow the government, it's none of their business. That's our policy. Uh, and the idea of bringing a violation of free trade into this is totally irrelevant. If that's the case, we throw out the World Trade Organization along with the International Court of Justice or anybody else who doesn't understand about markets and democracy. Incidentally, if the Stuart Eisenstadt had known a little more history, uh, he would have known that this policy goes back not to the early 60s, but to 1820. The 1820s, in fact, it's the first major foreign policy issue in American history. Uh, and the problem then was how to take over Cuba with a deterrent in the way, namely the British fleet. And when things finally shifted around, U US took it over a century ago. Uh, but that's ancient history, so we won't go into it. Uh, uh, we're also not supposed to remember other sort of trivial things, like, for example, the fact that a few months ago, the Clinton administration slapped uh, prohibitive tariffs on Mexican tomatoes uh, at a cost of something close to a billion dollars a year for Mexican producers. And there was an official reason then, too. The official reason is that Mexican tomatoes are cheaper than Florida-grown tomatoes, and American consumers prefer them. Uh, so, in other words, the free market was working, but with the wrong outcome. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, Mexican tomatoes were also posing a national security threat. I don't think they uh, did that. Well, actually, I, I agree that it's fair to overlook all of this, that these really are trivialities. Uh, the reason is uh, uh, they become, you see how trivial they are when you look at the most, at the, uh, while you're sort of hailing the triumph of the American passion for free markets, uh, you see how trivial they are when you look at the case that's given as an illustration, telecommunications. Uh, uh, in that respect, everything I've just said really is a minor footnote. Uh, the real story is not too obscure. Uh, the telecommunications industry is a textbook example of decisive and massive state intervention which virtually created the industry and has sustained it by huge transfer of public resources to private profit. Uh, from the early 1960s, uh, and in particular in the 1980s, uh, uh, what is now ADARPA, the Pentagon Research Agency, uh, ARPA at various points, uh, DARPA has played a leading role in uh, developing uh, the new technologies that gave U.S. companies the uh, commanding lead that they now have. That's true both for hardware and for software. If there's some engineers around here, they'll know all about this. But if you look at, say, time sharing or networking or uh, advanced microprocessor design, uh, parallel processing, uh, the whole range of stuff, most of it comes straight out of DARPA planning and funding, including the startup companies and so on. Uh, as for the Internet, that's just the ARPANET. You know, it's a mili un designed under military cover, now converted to the internet, recently handed over to private mega corporations and a huge act of privatization. Uh, that's not to speak of the satellites and the fiber optics and the semiconductor industry, which was saved from destruction in the 1980s by massive Reaganite state intervention, which broke all records, uh, and on and on. That's the telecommunications industry. If that demonstrates the passion for free markets, they are very strange creatures indeed. Uh, but again, polite people are not supposed to notice this. Uh, well, I don't want to suggest that the picture is confined to the New York Times uh, and others who hail the uh, success for American corporations, or as they prefer to put it, the triumph of traditional American values. Uh, perhaps accurately, in fact, though not in the sense they mean. Uh, the same picture of the world is also held by critics, uh, no, no matter how far out you go, in fact. So take, say, the progressive 
which is about as far as you can go and still be in something considered, uh, I don't know what, <laughs> edges of the spectrum. Uh, their March issue, the one that's just coming out, has a review uh, that warns against, uh, it re re reviews a book, a book by Robert Kuttner. Uh, the book warns against uh, giving society over whole hog to free markets. Uh, the, the, the review points out that the author knows that he's writing into the wind. Republicans and Democrats alike are now fully dedicated to free markets without government interference, what the Times calls American values, uh, as in the case of telecommunications. Uh, now, actually, there is a kernel of truth embedded in that picture. Uh, come back to it, but it's only a, a kernel. It's a part of the story. And the picture is therefore extremely misleading. Uh, the history of the telecommunications industry is one of innumerable illustrations of the rest of the story. And when you put it together, it's quite different from what you hear, uh, virtually without exception. You know, let me give a last example from a mainstream liberal journal, this liberal in the US sense now, uh, The New Yorker. They have a very good economics correspondent a while back, he had a useful article uh, on the travail of the middle class, I'm quoting it, and the unprecedented redistribution of income toward the rich in the past 20 years, uh, which indeed has harmed those who were left behind, which turns out to be a majority of the population. Uh, the typical American family is actually worse off in the mid-90s than in the late 70s. Uh, the Specific data are pretty dramatic. I won't go into them, but there is a very, it's a lot of data and it's easily accessible. The major study is the, uh, is a big volume that comes out every two years called the State of Working America, the 1966, 1967, 1996, 1997 edition just came out. Uh, lots of tables and data and so on, looking at this from all points of view. And they conclude that uh, higher profitability, uh, higher return on capital, and uh, higher CEO pay may be the only payoff uh, uh, or concrete sign of accomplishment from 16 years of transition to a more deregulated economy with some spillover effects for professionals and others at the top end of the income distribution, pretty small end, in fact. Uh, notice it's a shift to a more deregulated economy, which is more or less accurate, but certainly not a shift to a more free market economy. Quite the contrary, in fact. Uh, the, uh, going back to the article in The New Yorker, uh, it uh, reviews a lot of the data on this, a lot of which I'm sure you know, it's all over the place. Uh, the, uh, 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 it, there's some, it's an interesting story, but there's a couple of things missing. For example, there's nothing said, virtually nothing said about the winners in this game uh, and what role they may have had in designing the policy. In fact, he concludes that all of this is nobody's fault it is just how capitalism has developed. It's what the free market has decided in its infinite and mysterious wisdom. And politicians will have to accept the fact, uh, recognizing that what amount to virtual laws of nature can't be changed. Uh, uh, we can have democratic forms if we like, uh, but their reach is very narrow. Uh, uh, because this is just what the free market decided in its mysterious wisdom. Uh, and in fact, that's true everywhere now, not just here, uh, now that the uh, whole world is adopting or being compelled to adopt the traditional American values uh, imposed through the Washington Consensus and the free trade agreements, uh, which are new and more effective methods of intervention into the internal affairs of others, rather selectively, as the few examples I gave illustrate. Well, again, a closer look tells us a little more about the relation between reality and the doctrinal system through which it's filtered. So the article does tell us what the free market has decided, but it doesn't tell us about the business enterprises that are somehow involved in all of this in some mysterious way. Actually, it does mention three corporations. There are three corporations mentioned in the article, uh, McDonnell Douglas, Grumman, and Hughes Aircraft. 
uh, each of them also a textbook example of massive state intervention in the economy in radical violation of our traditional passion for free markets. Uh, in fact, the three do illustrate very well the traditional operative values, which are that cost and risk should be socialized, but private uh, profit should be privatized. Uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, the system that we proudly call free enterprise. Uh, the uh, examples chosen to illustrate the miraculous wisdom of the market are as good as the choice of telecommunications to illustrate our passion for free markets, or for example, uh, uh, say, America's most valuable corporation in last year's fortune list, General Electric, very similar history if you look at it, up till today, or take, say, uh, Clinton's choice you know, when he preached uh, what was called the gospel of free markets by the New York Times, uh, offering his grand vision of the free market future to much acclaim at the APEC meeting, the Asia Pacific meeting in Seattle. Uh, he preached the gospel in the Boeing terminal and he gave Boeing as the prime example of the gospel of free markets. Uh, leading exporter, leading exporter in the United States, uh, big markets in China and Saudi Arabia and so on. Actually now one of the two corp corporations worldwide uh, that are producing civilian aircraft, Airbus and Boeing. Uh, both of them beneficiary, beneficiaries of large scale state intervention. They wouldn't exist without it from their origins. Uh, sometimes that's just massive direct subsidy. Uh, sometimes it's indirect. Uh, as when what are called commercial jets, the things you fly on, uh, borrow the technology that is developed in the state sector, which is completely standard and very crucial. Well, again, the wisdom of the market is mysterious indeed, if uh, examples like these illustrate it, as in fact they do. Uh, I'll return to some other illustrations of the curious current scene, but let me turn aside for a moment and look at a little history. First, two phases, first since World War II and then a little bit from further back. Uh, since World War II, the current phase that we're still in, uh, there, all of these issues have arisen very sharply. Uh, as you know, there was a deep depression. Uh, the New Deal measures had virtually no effect on it. They softened the edges a little, but it was basically the same. Uh, but it was overcome by World War II. Uh, in World War II, there was a semi-command economy, state-coordinated economy. It was extremely successful. American industrial production more than tripled. Uh, the uh, control over resources, allocation of resources, uh, control over wages, the designation of areas of production through state power was extremely efficient, as indeed it was in England also at the same time. England actually outproduced Germany during that period after it turn to state controls over production. Uh, these, uh, there were some lessons taught, and they were taught to just the people who needed to know them, uh, namely to the corporate managers who flocked to Washington to run the semi-command economy. I'm actually quoting Alfred Chandler, the leading American business historian who points this out, uh, but it's clearly the case. They learned that there is a way to maintain uh, something remotely like a capitalist system, namely with massive state subsidy and direction and control. And they're the guys who had to know it because they were running it. So they didn't have to read it in textbooks, they had experienced it. Overcame the depression, was a big shot in the arm to the economy. Uh, right after the war, there was a consensus, extremely broad consensus going from economists like then young Paul Samuelson and others all the way across to business leaders that if this government stimulus and support were to drop, we'd head right back to the Depression, which was pretty realistic. That's what pulled the country out of the Depression. Anyway, that was the consensus. And uh, you don't have to go to secret sources at this time. The business press quite openly uh, said that the government is going to have to do something about it. Uh, Fortune magazine pointed out that high-tech industry cannot survive in an unsubsidized, competitive, free enterprise economy. Uh, Business Week added that the government has to be the savior. Uh, there was pretty general agreement on this. Uh, it was understood, just like you learn in your 
elementary economics course that any kind of government spending can serve as a stimulus, like social spending or military spending or you know hiding dollars in the sand or whatever you like. They'll all work. They understood this. Uh, and in fact, there was a debate in the business press in the late 40s uh, about which path to follow, social spending or military spending. And it was decided pretty quickly, explicitly, in fact, that military spending would be a much better path. Uh, the reason was that social spending has a downside, even if it would work. Uh, first of all, it's redistributive. Uh, secondly, it has a democratizing effect, because like people sort of care where you're going to build a hospital or something. Uh, it's also not a uh, direct gift to corporations. It sort of just filters indirectly. Well, military spending has none of these defects. It's a direct gift to corporations. Uh, it's redistributive, but the right way. Uh, and it has no democratizing effect, in fact, quite the opposite. People have no opinion on what kind of jet plane to build or something. So it, it's just perfect. And furthermore, it's easy to sell, and that was recognized too. Uh, the point was put rather succinctly by uh, Truman's first, air, the, the first Air Force Secretary, uh, Secretary Symington, Truman's secretary. Uh, he pointed out that, as he put it, the word to use is not subsidy, the word to use is security. And if you can get people to tremble in fear, uh, you can carry out the subsidy, calling it security. So military spending is the perfect solution to the problem that, as everyone recognized, the capitalist system just isn't viable, and there has to be a massive public subsidy for it and some degree of intervention and control. Well, that was very widely understood. Uh, it uh, soon turned to a kind of international military Keynesianism, as it's sometimes called. Uh, the revival of Japan and Europe uh, very crucially uh, d depended on US military spending uh, after the meager and disappointing effects of the Marshall Plan were played out. But they did get revitalized for the Korean War and big military spending and so on. The Vietnam War had the same highly stimulating effect, at this time also for South Korea, which traces its economic takeoff to that. Uh, by uh, 1940, and this is well understood, in fact, even before the Korean War, by 1948, the business press was hailing Truman's Cold War spending as a magic formula for almost endless good times. Uh, it's a way to inject new strength into the entire economy. Uh, by 1952, it was quoting, obvious that foreign economies as well as our own are mainly dependent on the scope of continued arms spending in this country, uh, which is serving as a cover for public subsidy under the guise of security subsidy to advanced industry. I'm quoting Steel Magazine and Magazine of Wall Street in this case. And, but it's typical. You know, it's all across the board in the business press. Uh, and so the story continues. Uh, uh, just about everywhere. Take, say, computers, like sort of core element of a modern industrial society. Uh, in the 1950s, they were kind of big, clunky things with the vacuum tubes always blowing up and too much paper around and that sort of business. You couldn't sell them, in other words. So the public uh, support for them was about 100%. Uh, they, were control they were designed under the security guys, like at Lincoln Labs at MIT, where I am, and where actually my wife worked as a programmer uh, with a security clearance, so I wasn't supposed to know what was happening. The, uh, uh, they were designing what was called an air defense system. I doubt that anybody in it thought it was ever going to stop anything but maybe a World War I fighter plane that got lost. But uh, the air defense system did develop the basic architecture and software and structure for modern computers. When it got advanced enough, some of the leading figures in that pulled out, one of them formed Dell, later IBM came along, and so on. By the 1960s, these things were marketable, uh, and the public support reduced to about 50 percent, and it sort of oscillates up and back. In the 1980s, it went up again because there were fifth generation computers coming along and parallel processing and all sorts of new fancy stuff, so the public share went up again. Uh, and this is pretty public, I should say. Like, say, Star Wars was sold to the public as a system, you know, we're going to defend ourselves from Martians or somebody. Uh, but to the business world, it was sold pretty frankly as just a subsidy to 
next generation of computer technology and lasers and so on and so forth. There was no big secret about it. Uh, that, uh, uh, and what's true of computers is true of just about anything else. In the 50s, about 85% of R&D, research and development, and electronics altogether was publicly subsidized, and it remains at various levels uh, since, I won't go into details. Uh, the same is true of the aeronautical industry, of uh, automation as a striking example. It was so inefficient that for several decades it had to be developed in the state sector, finally handed over to private enterprise. Uh, you know, uh, containers and so containerization, uh, machine tools is a dramatic example. It's well studied in this case, an important work by Dave Noble, the energy industry nobody even argues about, uh, biotechnology, uh, pharmaceuticals, in fact, just about every dynamic sector of the economy. Uh, that even includes services. So from one of the biggest parts of the service industries is tourism, huge industry, which is, of course, aircraft-based an enormous source of profits for services to U.S.-based companies. Uh, and so it goes. Uh, I uh, will skip the rest, but as I say, it's extremely hard to find some dynamic sector of the U.S. economy that doesn't rely on this kind of thing fairly crucially. Uh, sometimes overwhelmingly, sometimes less so, but always significantly. Now, there are variations. It's not like a uniform story. Uh, so take, say, the Reagan administration. Uh, the Reaganites were extreme in their contempts for, contempt for markets. They really hated them, uh, in practice, that is. Uh, to the public, uh, the Reagan administration was full of uh, you know, wonderful praise for the uh, miracles of the free market. Uh, that's both to the third world and to poor people at home. Uh, to the business world, they were sending a different message. So uh, Secretary of Treasury James Baker uh, informed the business world uh, that the uh, Reagan administration, he boasted that they had uh, instituted more protection for American business than any administration in post-war American history, which was in fact far too modest. It was more protection than all post-war administrations combined. They had virtually doubled one or another form of protection. Uh, amounting to tariffs, though sometimes by the devices, uh, that was used, targeted specifically, to, to save the American steel industry, automotive industry, uh, machine tools, uh, semiconductors. Uh, it's unnecessary for aircraft because it's already publicly subsidized. Uh, that's what saved them. Otherwise, they would, if the free market had been allowed to function, they presumably would have been taken over by much cheaper and more efficient uh, Japanese and other industries. But the market was effectively closed, and a lot of subsidies were poured in, and that saved the industries. Uh, and again, it's no secret. Uh, so like Foreign Affairs, uh, in its review of the decade, uh, points out later, I'm quoting it now, that the United States shifted in the 1980s from the world champion of multilateral free trade to one of its leading challengers uh, with the greatest swing toward protectionism since the 1930s. That much is true, but it's only a small part of the story because it omits the huge public subsidies to high-tech industry, the initiation of new technologies, startup companies, uh, the unprecedented uh, public bailouts, the biggest nationalization in American history, and a lot more. Uh, there's a scholarly study of GATT by one of the chief economists of the GATT Secretariat, sort of the main study of GATT in the modern period. Uh, he estimates, Patrick Lowe is his name, he estimates uh, Reaganite restrictions on free trade as about three times any foreign counterpart. This is what he says, part of the sustained assault on free trade principles by the industrial countries from the early 1970s. There's no time to go into this, but the early 1970s are important. That's when the financial systems were deregulated uh, after the Nixon administration broke down the Bretton Woods Agreement, something which had had an enormous effect on the international economy probably the biggest change in world order since World War II, but it takes us off in another direction, so I'll drop it. Uh, uh, important direction. Well, all of these things have had effects. Uh, one of the effects is the unprecedented redistribution of income toward the very rich that is complained about and attributed to the free market, and also the steady decline of the majority, 
uh, as we're moving towards a society which has uh, notable uh, structural similarities to the third world, it's very rich countries, it's not going to look like Brazil, but the structural similarities are quite obvious. I mean, take any third world country and now Eastern Europe, now that it's going back to the third world where it belongs uh, and was for five centuries, uh, the uh, uh, there's a small sector, kind of like an island of extreme wealth and privilege. There's a big sector kind of ranging from suffering to outright misery. And there's just a lot of superfluous people who don't contribute to profit making and you've got to get rid of them somehow. Uh, in countries like, uh, well, say, take the country that gets that most of our military aid in the 1990s in the hemisphere, Colombia. Uh, there they get rid of them by just murdering them. Uh, that's what the military aid is for, uh, social cleansing, uh, large-scale killing by the military and the paramilitary and so on. We're more civilized. We don't kill them. Uh, we throw them into jail. So the jails are going way up, far beyond. Incarceration is completely uncorrelated with crime, far beyond any industrial society. In fact, we now are competing with the world championship with China. Uh, and have been for some years and still going up. So that's a superfluous population. Uh, none of this is the result of the wisdom of the market, miraculous or not, but it is definitely the result of explicit social policy. Well, uh, these uh, effects, I should say, have led to real euphoria among the winners. The business press is pretty amazing in this respect. So in Business Week, in a review of 1996, it uh, points out that profits were spectacular. Uh, that's up from dazzling and stunning in the two previous years of uh, double-digit profit growth, which has been going on through the last couple of years. Uh, by far the biggest winner that they reported in 1996 were what they call aerospace and defense. Defense is a euphemism. Uh, they're far ahead, maybe about twice as, twice as much profit as the competitors. Uh, which are also beneficiaries of the transfer of public funds to private profit in an earlier period. And that continues, again, reported in the business press. Like, you know, you read the Wall Street Journal on the back pages of the New York Times, you'll learn about it. Uh, so, for example, last November, uh, Japan announced a new government program of up to about a billion dollars uh, to aid Japanese companies to regain uh, the ground that they lost when the Reaganite programs of massive state intervention, mostly disguised as military spending, uh, um, uh, uh, saved U.S. companies uh, in semiconductors and gave them a big step ahead in chip making and other technologies, part of what makes possible our current passion in telecommunications. Uh, the same day, the Clinton administration announced a program to build new military jets uh, with profits that are estimated they may run to $750 billion or more when foreign sales are included, which will be uh, uh, aided, in fact, decisively by aggressive government intervention. Uh, particularly interesting was the fact that uh, in that proposal for this huge jet uh, program, McDonnell Douglas was excluded from competition in favor of Boeing. And that was noticed by industry analysts. Uh, Boeing had just won a billion dollar contract for a laser system for 747s, called a defense system as usual. Uh, the reasoning for cutting McDonnell Douglas Act was, and in favor of Boeing was explained by Pentagon officials and by aerospace industry analysts. The reason is that Boeing uh, has essentially the American monopoly for commercial aircraft, and therefore new technologies have to go to it directly uh, to expedite the growth of commercial production, not just indirectly in the usual fashion. So therefore we'll give them the military jet contracts directly, and then they can just use it without wasting any time for commercial jets and remain uh, the model of the free market uh, when we preach the gospel. Uh, this uh, an aerospace analyst at Merrill Lynch pointed out that this is, involves a shift from a military-industrial economy to an industrial-military economy. 
kind of more frank, in other words. And in fact, one use, actually that was a Pentagon official, uh, one useful effect of the end of the Cold War has been to uh, you kind of lift the clouds. You know, it's kind of harder to maintain print pretenses, so we'll now call it what it is, an industrial military economy with military just uh, used to, as much as we can, other devices if we can't, uh, to ensure that, uh, that the rich aren't, don't have to face market discipline, which can be pretty tough. Uh, I don't want to suggest that business doesn't have any problems. They do. Uh, so about a year ago, Business Week had a headline saying, the problem now, uh, what to do with all that cash uh, as uh, profits are overflowing the coffers of corporate America and uh, uh, are booming and so on. And that is a problem, because it's not really clear what to do with all that money. Uh, just about a week ago, February 10th, uh, Business Week updated it. They had an article say, pointing out that the liquid assets of non-financial companies in the United States had reached what they call a staggering $679 billion, and that poses vexing problems at places like Boeing and IBM and Intel and Ford. The problem is, what are you going to do with all this money? We can't figure out what to do with it. Uh, the, uh, uh, meanwhile, in these lean and mean times that we live in, uh, we have to be able to accept happily the by far the highest poverty rate in the world, uh, worse child poverty rate in, in, in the industrial world, uh, in any industrial country, literal starvation, uh, and uh, all the other problems that just come from the miracles of the market. And we, of course, also have to uh, uh, reduce the capital gains tax because it's important to free up funds for new investment since the 600, staggering $679 billion that's sitting there nobody knows what to do with, so some new funds have to be gotten and lowering the capital gains tax, of course, means transferring uh, uh, taxes regressively toward the poor, and all of this is to be understood, and you're not supposed to laugh about it. Uh, and in fact, it takes a pretty well-disciplined doctrinal system and a very well-compartmentalized mind to be able to handle all of these things and uh, not to do what those 40 million Mexicans might have done if they were told that Cuba was a security threat. Well, uh, there's a lot more to say about this, but let me just say a word about the earlier history, uh, which is itself interesting, before World War II. You can learn a lot from that. Uh, in the 18th century, the differences between what is now the first and the third world were much less sharp than they are today. So for example, India uh, was the uh, major commercial and industrial center of the world. It was producing more iron than all of Europe, for example, in the 18th century. And in fact, until the 1820s, British engineers were still going to India to learn advanced steelmaking techniques and so on. Uh, actually, it's very likely that wages in South Indian industry were actually comparable or may, to or maybe even better than British industry, along with working conditions. There's interesting new scholarship on this. Uh, the, uh, all of this raises some questions, two obvious questions. Uh, which countries developed and which countries didn't? And secondly, what were the factors? Well, the first question we can dispense with very quickly. There's no question about it. Uh, Europe developed and so did uh, some of the regions that were free of European control. Uh, two in particular, the United States, which had freed itself from European control, and Japan, which is the one part of the third world that was able to resist colonization. Japan brought along a couple of its colonies in tow. Japan was an extremely brutal uh, imperial power, but it treated its colonies differently from the West. It developed them. So what is now Taiwan and Korea developed under Japanese rule at about the same rate as Japan. They didn't rob them, they developed them for whatever reason. Uh, so those are the two exceptions. Uh, the two parts of the world that were able to resist European colonization developed, again, something you're not supposed to notice, uh, and maybe suggest something. Uh, what turned to the factors? Well, uh, a lot of this is not very well understood. Economic growth is not a very well understood thing, uh, but some things are pretty clear. Uh, so one of the most eminent economic historians in the world, Paul Bayroche, who published an interesting book about all this stuff recently, uh, points out that, to quote him, that there is no doubt 
that the third world's compulsory economic liberalism uh, was a major element in explaining the delay in its industrialization and in the very revealing case of India, the process of deindustrialization that turned the world's leading workshop and trading center into a deeply impoverished agricultural society with a sharp decline in real wages and food consumption and so on. Well, what about the successful societies? Again, lots isn't understood, uh, but there are, uh, I, I should mention that this is neoliberalism, what I was just describing, uh, for the defenseless. The developed societies, though a lot is not understood, one thing seems pretty clear, uh, and that is uh, that, and I think it's without exception from England up to the East Asian growth area, that radical violation of market principles was a significant factor, maybe the decisive factor, uh, in their successful development, just as imposition of market principles was a major factor in the undeveloped, dedevelopment, or even you know, the industrialization of parts of the third world, maybe all of it. Uh, the, uh, so say, take for example, the United States. Like how come we're not pursuing our comparative advantage in say exporting fur? Don't seem to be doing that. Uh, there was an industrial revolution started around Eastern Massachusetts with textiles as it always does. Uh, how was the US able to produce textiles? Is it because the textiles from Lowell were cheaper than England? No, they were much more expensive. Uh, England was providing much cheaper and better textiles, uh, but the US was free. Uh, so it was able to set up high protectionist barriers and to develop a textile industry with a big spillover to other related industries. Uh, the uh, same is true of, say, steel. Uh, the steel, British steel was far better and cheaper than American steel a century ago, but high tariff barriers made it possible for Andrew Carnegie to set up the uh, world's first billion dollar corporation along with big naval contracts and so on. Remember, he was a pacifist, but within limits. Uh, this, uh, uh, so we get a steel industry and so it goes on up till the present. I gave a couple of examples. Uh, the, uh, and this is not unknown. Uh, the, and so, uh, uh, I, I sh uh, in fact, the U.S. is described, for example, by, by Roche as the mother country and bastion of modern protectionism. In fact, it was way in the lead through the period of its growth. Uh, these uh, are pretty much staples of economic history, but they leave out an awful lot uh, because of the way academic disciplines are divided up. So protectionism is only one factor, and you can see that pretty clearly. Uh, take, say, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it uh, was based on the, the major commodity in world trade, of course, and the core of the Industrial Revolution was cotton. There had to be cheap and available cotton for the Industrial Revolution to take place in England and then the United States. Well, how is it kept cheap and available? like market forces? No, no. I mean, it was kept cheap and available by extermination of the indigenous population in the southeast United States and by bringing in slaves. It's kind of serious violation of market forces. Actually, Texas and a third of Mexico were taken over quite explicitly in order to gain, they hoped, a monopoly on cotton. Uh, the, uh, this has nothing to do with the market. Uh, the uh, a contemporary analog is energy, where there's a large scale public subsidy to the price through the whole protection, military protection system. Uh, well, factors of that kind are just not considered in economic history, uh, and they're not considered part of, uh, the under of state intervention, but they means that it very much understates its role. Uh, there were other cotton producers back around the time that U.S. cotton took off, like India or Egypt, both major cotton producers. Uh, India just blocked by violence, so they destroyed the British. British managed to destroy the uh, Indian cotton industry and textiles. In the case of Egypt, it was about the same. Egypt, it's hard to believe now, but it was a major agricultural exporter and a big cotton producer, and it was starting an industrial revolution about the same time the United States was, but that was barred. Uh, the British refused to allow independent development in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and they were quite frank about it. Uh, Palmerston, foreign minister, said that uh, no ideas of fairness to Egypt ought to stand in the way of such great and paramount interests of Britain, 
as maintaining domination of this region and blocking, uh, and blocking competitors. Uh, the U.S., in contrast, was free to follow the course of the mother country, England, uh, with uh, radical departures from market principles. Uh, England, of course, did turn to liberal internationalism in, famously in 1846. Uh, that was after 150 years of protectionism and violence, and in fact, organization of Europe's most efficient developmental state had led to double the per capita capitalization of any other country. So under those conditions, uh, a level playing field looked pretty nice, uh, and England did turn to liberal internationalism, uh, but with some significant reservations uh, even then, the period of free trade. So about 40% of British textiles went to colonized India and that was pretty much true of British exports generally. When British steel was priced out of international markets, they could still export to the, to the colonies. Uh, by the 1920s, when Britain couldn't compete any longer with more efficient and modernized Japanese industry, they just called the game off. Uh, in 1932, the empire was effectively closed to Japanese competition because uh, free market wasn't working anymore. It's part of the background for World War II. Other countries did the same. Uh, at that time, if you look, Indian manufacturers were indeed pleading for protection, but from England, not from Japan, but under the way markets work. No, that wasn't the answer. Uh, uh, in the conclusion is quite general. Uh, free trade is fine, great game, as long as you're going to win. Uh, a century after England, in 1945, the United States turned to the same direction. It abandoned its high levels of protectionism and called for a free trade, international liberalization. That was after 150 years of uh, violence and massive protectionism and market interference had put the United States way ahead of any competitor. It actually had half the wealth of the world at the time, uh, and a living level playing field looked like a nice idea, but again with reservations. So complementary development, as it was called, was going to be blocked in other countries, and it was by force. And there were massive subsidies through the military system and others, also to agro-export and other devices, uh, to make sure that the level playing field was still tilted radically in the proper direction. By the 1980s, the Reaganites just called the game off again, uh, and uh, as I described, and today, the sectors of the economy that were helped to get back in business and regain the lead, uh, they are now passionate uh, advocates of the free market. Well, I think that's the relevant, I barely touched on it, but that's the relevant history of the telecommunications agreement. No miracles of the market, but there is a law. Uh, markets are great if we're going to win. Uh, in fact, there is what we might call really existing market doctrine. Uh, market discipline is good for you, but I need the protection of the nanny state, so not for me, please. Uh, the really existing doctrine is operative policy, uh, discipline for the defenseless and the poor, like seven-year-old children, they have to learn responsibility, but the rich and the privileged, uh, for them, a powerful state. A look at the Reaganite policies makes this very clear. It's getting late, but let me give just one last dramatic illustration. I'll take the lead commentator of the New York Times, Tom Friedman, uh, who says that with the hawk dove distinction over, the issue now is between the safety netters, as he calls them, and the let them eat cakers. This everyone agrees, he says, on globalization. And that's we can't even talk about that. Uh, but uh, there is a distinction. And he picks two examples, Clinton example, the safety netter, Gingrich is an example of the integrationist let them eat cakers. That's uh, about two weeks ago. Well, that's, a, that's not, a, you know, that's not a, like a tautology. It's an empirical thesis, which means you can test it. So we can take Gingrich and ask whether he's an integrationist let them eat caker. Well, how do we test it? Well, we, for example, Gingrich was in Congress during the 1980s, and we can ask how he voted during this massive assault against free markets uh, for the benefit of the rich, who did indeed benefit, how did he vote? Well, in favor of it. Okay, conclusion number one, he's certainly no integrationist. He didn't believe in global markets. Uh, what about the let him eat caker? Is he an example of that? 
Well, you know, there's a way to test that, too. I mean, he's a congressman. He represents a district, namely Cobb County, Georgia, uh, which happens to win the, world ch the national championship in federal subsidies among suburban counties. The only exceptions are the ones that are part of the federal government itself, like, say, Arlington, Virginia. They get a little bit more. That's where the Pentagon is. But if you go out of the federal system, Cobb County is first. Uh, so he's achieved the, in fact, the whole Atlanta region is like this. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that Gingrich is the leading advocate of uh, welfare dependency, a really existing market theory, uh, full of uh, you know, all sorts of rhetoric about uh, third world peasants and poor children that have to learn responsibility and this kind of thing, but not his rich constituents. Uh, they require a powerful nanny state to maintain their welfare dependency. Well, these are not big secrets. Uh, and it's a kind of a task of a doctrinal system to conceal all of that so that the losers, who are the majority, accept their uh, fate quietly. And this, incidentally, is completely general. It's not the United States. I'll give only one example to illustrate how general, but it's completely universal. Uh, th there's a recent technical study, the only one detailed one I know, of the top 100 transnational corporations in the fortune list, just published in England by two economists. Uh, they just run through the top 100 national big highest corporations in the fortune list, and they look at their policies and record and so on, a lot of interesting stuff. One conclusion is that all 100 benefited from the industrial policy of their home country, and 20 at least, they say, were saved from complete destruction as enterprises by either massive state takeover or huge bailouts in their home country. Uh, one of them is Gingrich's favorite cash cow, Lockheed, which was given a $200, $2 billion bailout by the Nixon administration. Uh, that's, that's the way the world works. Uh, going back to minimizing the state, yeah, there's minimizing the state, uh, but that's maximizing not the people's rule, but the private power which lies behind it and is designing social policy. That's where decision making is transferred. Uh, and furthermore, these corporations don't believe in free trade. You have to, under, not quite apart from the massive subsidies and socialization of risk, uh, remember that, more, that what's called trade is, that's a kind of an odd word for it, uh, over half of U.S. trade, what's called trade in the, in the United States, over half of it is intra-firm within a particular firm that's internal to a huge command economy run by a very visible hand uh, with all sorts of techniques of undercutting uh, market effects and so on. And this is pretty well understood. Uh, so uh, 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 the... Uh, Last comment I'll make is the following, and I'll just leave it as a question. Uh, there is th this question about use of public funds for private profit. You know, there, there are some real questions there. Some of them are non-trivial. Uh, one question is, how should public funds uh, be used to uh, create the basis for the future economy and intellectual culture? Real question, non-trivial. Uh, second question. Should the results of all of this, whatever it is, be handed over to private power through the socialization of risk and cost technique that we use? Third, should the issues be discussed in the public arena? Uh, that is, who should decide? Well, the first question you can certainly argue about. Maybe the second, I don't think so. But on the third, there shouldn't be any debate, at least among people who think that democracy might be a good idea. Uh, that is, they ought to be discussed in the public arena and ought to be a public decision, not something that people are manipulated and deceived into accepting with all kind of fraudulent rhetoric about the wisdom of the market and, you know, minimizing of the state and responsibility and so on, at least, again, for people who think that democracy is something useful to think about. Thanks. of inquiry in modern linguistics.
as well as much adjacent territory in psychology and philosophy, it always comes as a shock to see how differently the rest of the world sees him. I first became aware of this when I realized that the MIT branch of the Harvard Coop stocked copies of his book, Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, in the politics and current affairs section of the store. <laughs> I hate to think how many more stores did the same with lectures on government and binding. In responding to his work on political, economic, and social issues, as with his work in linguistics, one can sometimes disagree with the specifics of his analyses and conclusions, but their cogency and coherence are never in doubt. And it's virtually never possible to cite relevant factual or background material that he hasn't read and taken into account. Yesterday afternoon, in a lecture commemorating one of the major figures in linguistics in the history of the, our department here at Yale, Bernard Bloch, Professor Chomsky gave us a picture of the scope of his ideas in the science of language. Today, we're pleased and privileged to hear some of another side of his thought. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Noam Chomsky, who will speak to us today on neoliberalism and global order. A number of us graduate students were rather selfishly concerned that this effort would result in a decrease in the level of excitement of doing linguistics in his department. Well, we certainly didn't need to worry. Then, as now, he somehow managed to provide us with a constant series of new challenges in our field, while simultaneously challenging the conscience and sense of complacency of the society and the broader world with a series of incredibly detailed incisive analyses of the events of our times. Actually, I'm not sure linguistics could have stood the strain of constant innovation that would have resulted if he'd had all his time free for science. <laughs> his ability to balance scientific activity with his life as a public figure surely has few, if any, parallels in our time. Indeed, when I heard the other day about the success of some Scots geneticists in achieving the cloning of a large mammal, I wondered a bit whether their results might not have been anticipated years ago at MIT in secret. I can't imagine how just one Noam Chomsky can possibly keep up with his reading, let alone produce the quantity and quality of written work that he has on linguistic, political, and economic issues, ranging from Timor to the Middle East, to Central America and South America, and to our own society in this country that has come from him in the past 30-odd years. For those of us who know Noam Chomsky as the scholar who has essentially defined global order is fairly accurate, but not the rest. Uh, the operative doc doctrines are not at all new, and they are very remote, in my opinion, from the leading ideas that animated the classical liberal tradition uh, since the Enlightenment. Well, before proceeding, side comment on terminology. Uh, the terminology of social and political discourse is not a model of uh, crystal clarity. Uh, in this area, it is hopeless. Uh, so hopeless that communication is almost impossible. Uh, the standard usage here today is almost the reverse of traditional usage, uh, which is also common elsewhere in the world. Uh, so what we call here liberal um, in most places is called something like social democratic, uh, and what is called liberal in the tradition and virtually everywhere else, we don't really have any name for. Uh, sometimes it's called conservative, sometimes it's called libertarian, which just introduces even more confusion because the term libertarian is used here as virtually the antithesis of the traditional usage and the usage in most other places. Uh, else here, libertarian means extreme uh, capitalist, which does indeed draw on a strand of classical liberalism, although not Adam Smith.
Welcome. On behalf of the Department of Linguistics, I'm Steve Anderson, the Chair of Linguistics here at Yale. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the assistance of the Camp Fund and of Calhoun College in making Noam Chomsky's visit to Yale possible, and also of the Yale Law School for making this facility available to us. There's a problem with speakers who need no introduction. It really won't do to let them go without one. But the introducer seldom has anything to say that warrants the time taken from the main event. So I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, I went to MIT to study linguistics in the mid-1960s, which was a time when Professor Chomsky's energy and attention was increasingly occupied with the resistance to the Vietnam War. I have to admit that a fair... Uh, somebody... Uh passed me a note yesterday in one of the many transitions up and back between meetings asking me to announce something, uh, an upcoming event, which I'm personally much interested in, but unfortunately I lost the note, so I'm not sure what the date was. Uh, it's uh, Constancio Pinto, who's uh, fled from East Timor, uh, who will be here, I think, March 6th. Anybody, is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so there'll be a meeting on that, which will be well worth going to, I'm sure, I know Constancio. Uh, okay, getting to this topic. Uh, there are two, uh, uh, two phrases in the title, uh, neoliberalism and global order. I'd like to say a bit about each of them. Uh, these are topics of enormous human significance. Uh, they're not very well understood, I think. Uh, the term neoliberalism, uh, suggests uh, a system of principles that is in the first place new uh, and in the second place based on classical liberal ideas. Uh, Adam Smith is typically revered as the patron saint. Uh, the same set of doctrines is also called the Washington Consensus, which may suggest something about global order. Uh, if we take a closer look I think we find that the suggestion about 